Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Family Life Week celebrations, commemorations. I am Anthony Mitchell, and this is my wife, Angela Mitchell. Uh, we'll be the facilitators for this afternoon, and we have some experience, a very experienced uh, person on the panel, Lucia Kanner, who will introduce herself when she comes on as well. And we also have some other perspectives from uh, Nicole John, Nicole and Sheldon, married couple with three children. And you have also have Jerome Alexander, who does a lot uh, with pornography, um, the issue of pornography, the new drug, as they, as they call it. So this afternoon, we are already looking at the importance of play in family life. And in addition, what are some of the signs or the problems that can happen when people become addicted to play, for example, in video games, the most, most um, popular form of play right now among many teenagers, what happens with these addictions? And how can we recognize these addictions? What can we do about them? So that's a brief introduction. As I said, Angela and I have been married almost 20 years. We have one child and we are very much involved in marriage preparation, specifically engage and counter. So I will now introduce you to our first uh, panelist, who is Lucia Kane. She is a clinical psychologist by profession, and she will now do what, give us a presentation on play and the family. So thank you very much for making yourselves available, Lucia, Nicole, and Jerome, and we will be moving on. Hi. Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you this evening as we celebrate marriage and family life this week. And this evening, my topic would be importance of play in the family and the dangers of addiction in entertainment. I am a clinical psychologist, as Tony shared with you. I am a master's level clinical psychologist and the co-founder of Kasui Associates. I'm also a member of the People of Praise prayer group they are part of the counseling ministry there. I'm a mother, a wife, and I have three beautiful children. So I'm sharing with you today, not only from my professional experience, but also from my personal experience. So today we wanna to look at the importance of playing the family. And I wanna take a look at authenticity inspired by love. You know, in our families, we are called to be authentic, but we can only be authentic if there is love in the family. And as Pope Francis said, the family is the school of love. We wanna explore the value of play in the family because many of us know about play for children, but we're looking at play as a family activity, including the adults in the family. And we wanna be able to explore strategies to include play in family life. Then we will have the panel discussion and then we come back on and we will talk about the dangers of addiction in entertainment. So I want to help you to understand addiction, some of the classifications used in addiction now, and we wanna address behavioral addiction in particular. So Pope Francis, in his documentation of Amoris Laetitia, shared with us about playing together as a family. In item 315, he speaks about living in a family makes it hard for us to hide behind masks. And we're not talking about the masks that are essential for everyday life now, given the COVID-19 pandemic. We are talking about psychological masks because as individuals, we all wear different hats at different times of the day. And that's the mask he's talking about, the different masks that we put on to fit in and fulfill the different roles that we play. But he's saying that the authenticity inspired by love in the family makes us acceptable as we are. And so when we come home one evening, we take off our shoes, we take off our belts, we really just relax and take off the makeup even, and we become real. But we can only do that in a place of love and acceptance. And that is based on the basis that the family is a school of love. The spirituality of family love is made up of thousands of small but real gestures. And play falls into one of these gestures where families can be authentic together, enjoy each other, and feel love without judgment. Play is the family inspired by love, provides this opportunity for authenticity. So what is play? We're using the word play all the time. 
but you know, you must have a little definition for people to understand what we're talking about. So to make sure we're all on the same page, I wanna use play as a verb, and it means to engage in activity for enjoyment and recreation, rather than for a serious or practical purpose. So just enjoyment and recreation. And so when we think of play, we see children playing with their friends. Yes, everybody thinks of children playing together, young ones, and even young adults and the teenagers, they get together with their friends and they play. Within the family, we can see mothers playing with their babies, mothers and fathers. We like to make all the funny faces and anything to make baby laugh, right? And this continues into the preschool years as well. So your toddlers, you're willing to play with the blocks of them and carry them outside in the yard, run around with them. Siblings often play together, just spontaneously and enjoy each other's time. And adults do play with each other as well. You have people who will go out the road and play some small goal, as we call it, or meet in the savannah to shoot some hoops, or ladies who may meet and take a walk. Of course, all of those things have been suspended right now because of COVID, but we know we can still go out in groups of five on the outside for recreation. And sooner or later, everything will be opened back up again. So play is something that everybody sees and you can't help but smile when you see people playing and having fun. But how many of you think of play as a family activity? Yes, this is what we're talking about this evening play as a family activity. Pope Francis in 2013, he said that when parents come to him complaining about their children, he asks them, do you waste time with your children? Of course, they look confused. Why would you ask me if I waste time? But he said that he's talking about playing with your children with no specific goals no objectives, just playing with them because they're yours and you want to just have fun with them. And knowing that they enjoy play, do you waste time or do you play with your children? Pope Francis says that play teaches children something about God's love for them. He says while we're playing, we demonstrate that love that is free, unconditional, and unaffected by anything that they say or do. And it's really one of the few times in the family that we're not correcting them or giving them directives as to what we want them to do. So through play, we are transmitting the faith because that's what our faith is based on, that unconditional, unsolicited love of God that, God, that we know that God loves us just by our birthright because we are his, we are his sons and daughters. And so the Pope shares with parents that through playing with your children, you are teaching them faith. You are being gracious and merciful to them. Psychology also outlines a lot of benefits of play. And for today, I'm using Dr. Amanda Gummer, who is a research psychologist. She says play is an opportunity for relaxation. That's why some of you go to the gym. That's why some of you go and play small goal after work, right? When everything was open. And that's why a lot of you are just waiting, waiting for things to open back up so that you can continue to meet with your peers and enjoy some form of relaxation. But right in your families, we can enjoy relaxation with the members of your family. There are many different ways and we will look at that after. Play opens the channels of communication. I've met families in my practice who are afraid of daddy because daddy's a disciplinarian. You know, they know they can talk to mommy, but they're afraid of daddy. But when you learn to play with each other and just have fun, just accept each other and have a good time, you open the channels of communication so that your children get to know you better. They're not afraid to approach you with some of the other things that they may want someone to talk to. Play helps us to develop various skills. Apart from learning to follow rules, if there's a game with rules, there's also spontaneous play. But of course, you can learn things like taking turns, social interactions, team building, and even how to laugh at yourself. Because that's an important um, skill that we need in um, society, you know. We have to learn to laugh at ourselves when we make mistakes. We can also teach children to not be upset when they come last, to be gracious winners and gracious losers. 
There are many teaching opportunities while playing. Sometimes a child may say something and you have the opportunity to model what is expected. You also have the opportunity to listen carefully to the conversations among the children as the game goes on, as you play, as you just waste time and do nothing but enjoy each other's company. There are lots of teaching opportunities that present themselves. Of course, as a family, playing games is a team building exercise because people may have different roles, different skills. You know, you see different sides, the quiet child who might be the fast runner. So if you go out and you're doing races, you see different sides of your children when you play games together. So they learn to be part of the team. And remember, team building will be very important in the family because even in our everyday lives, there are different roles that persons need to play. So if we can learn team building in the game, in playing, that can extend into everyday life. Play creates great, great memories. As adults, people look back on their childhood and some persons may have very negative childhoods and not much good things to reflect on. As parents, I always tell the parents who come to my office that your job is helping your children to be productive members of society. But for them to take that role, they have to have good memories to fall back on or else they're gonna be depressed or sour adults. Eric Erickson says that when persons reach over 60, they start to reflect on their past. And based on what that reflection brings forth, it can lead to depression. So start forming positive memories for your children from now. And of course, the main benefit is there will be stronger parent-child relationships. We know with increase in technology, your children and your, the, the older ones especially, they are speaking to people all over the world. So make sure that you're a person your child can come to when they have questions or when they wanna communicate or have conversations. So it's easy, you know, you can start today. If you weren't doing it before, that is not a problem. It doesn't take any big set of planning. You can start right now. Just get involved, just play, have fun. Children play all the time, regardless if it's on their phones or on their gaming devices, on the television, or, you know, we have different games now that they can play, or they go in the yard and play by themselves. You can just join them. Short daily bursts of spontaneity is important. Every day, at least 10 minutes, just jump in a game they're playing. They love to see you be goofy, you know, and they love to know that you're interested in what they're doing. So it doesn't have to be planned and it doesn't have to be whole day. Of course, for some of the bigger things, you can schedule the family play date. So you can schedule a game of Monopoly that you know you're gonna take long or any other board game. You know, when I say Monopoly, I guess it tells of my age. You can also schedule a karaoke night. You can schedule a, 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 what, a picnic in your yard. So there are many things you can schedule. The reason for scheduling would be you wanna ensure that every member of the family is available. So once you put on that schedule, everybody can come out. Consider everyone's talents, skills, and likes. Remember we said play is just free time. It could be structured, it could be unstructured. So for the ones that you are planning, you can use if it's, as I said, karaoke, if you have singers in your family or who love to sing, you have karaoke. You can have cooking as a family activity. So yes, you're cooking, but it's fun. It's not a teaching activity. It's nothing to stress anybody out. One family told me they did a cooking competition and I heard it was really fun. Okay. Um, so we wanna make sure you take people's likes and everything so that everybody participates and you don't have persons participating only on what they like or you're only doing what one person likes so I'm not coming. Indoor and outdoor activities. So you have a variety of activities. I spoke about some of the indoor activities already. You can play board games. You can just have singing, listening to music together. Of course, watching movies together is also fun and entertainment as well. And then you can have your outdoor activities, just going out in the yard. Then you have all the old time games like skipping. Yes, jump rope. That is really a lot of fun if you take turns and you count and you can even make it com competitive so that persons learn healthy competition. 
There are lots of other forms of entertainment. Some of them we don't have access to right now because of the restrictions that are evident with the COVID-19 pandemic, but you have outings that you can go on. You can go to the Savannah. You know, some of them cost absolutely no money. Pack up everybody in the car or take the bus, take a maxi taxi, head to the Queen's Park Savannah and have a picnic. You know, I remember for Easter, we went and we flew kites. Every single member of the family was there. So there are lots of other forms of entertainment, things that you can do together as a family. And of course, family outings, as I just mentioned, in terms of forms of entertainment. And these can be very, very simple, like going to the neighborhood Savannah, compared to going away, those who go away for vacations. You know what you can afford, you know what it takes to organize these things. So don't make your financial situation an excuse not to engage. They can be very simple, right in the neighborhood park to a big vacation with the whole family. So that is basically what I wanna share with you today about the importance of playing in the family. I hope that you recognize that it's not only children play and not only adults play with adults and children with children, but the whole family can enjoy each other through some fun play. And that way we spread the love, we become the schools of love that families are intended to be so that we can be authentic in our homes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Very comprehensive, very understandable, very down to earth. And now we'll probably just, I just have maybe one question for you. Um, does play also help build self-confidence in children? So for example, you play a game and a child wins and they say, oh, I win, I win, I win, I beat daddy, I beat mommy. Does, do you also find that that they build self-confidence um, as well? But one of the- um, Yes. Things, yes, yeah. that is one of the benefits of playing with the children. You know, it builds their confidence. It builds their competencies because each time you, I guess, you play a little harder and they get a little better as well, you know? So yes, it does. One of the things we have to guard against too is giving them that false sense of confidence. You know, I remember when my daughter, she grew up, Sometimes her daddy would let her win and she would be very, very upset because she did not want any help. She didn't want anybody helping her to win. She wanted to win on her own. And now she beats him at pool. So you see the competencies were built. So we have to be careful. Yes, we're building confidence, but we want to make sure that we're not making them feel that they can't do it. You know, everything has the flip side, not making them feel that they can't do it because we allow them to win easily. I also remember once we went to a family game night and there was one guy who was very competitive, the adult, and he was just winning, winning, winning. He did not care about the children getting a chance to win. So sometimes we have to weigh the situations, you know, don't make it too easy, but still allow them some success. Okay, right, thanks, thanks so much, very Lizzie. much. I guess he'll be playing pool much these days. All right. <laughs> But he, has, right. he has to beat her, so the, the, um, he has to learn to beat her back. Right, so, yes. <laughs> and uh, maybe I could just ask Nicole, um, Nicole, you have, you have three children, um, oh. or is it four? I've, lo I've lost count, you can, you can correct me. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> three. <laughs> three, all right, maybe I was prophetic. Um, I was just <laughs> wanted to know, you have three children, um, how or what sort of games do you play with them? Maybe you can give some examples. Um, so other people could have an idea what sort of things that families can do with their children, even during this confined period. Yes, sure. Um, good evening, everyone. I have three children. They're six, four, and two. Uh, the first two are boys and Julia. Um, we have a little girl who is two. And what we do, well, most of the time, I like to follow them. That's easiest for me, right? So, because like, um, as Miss Lucia said, the children will play they will just play. So some of the things we do very easily, they, they want to take all the cushions out of the chairs and put it in the hallway. And then they bring their, their, their um, pillows and sheets and have a sleepover. So sometimes, you know, I just join them in the sleepover and we talk and laugh and I'll probably bring a few books and I'll read to them or I'll let my six year old read to the younger two. Uh, that's wonderful, they love that. Um, going outside, um, we've discovered that we can draw on the wall with chalk, and that's fun. And then they get a little, um, a little bucket of soapy water, and then we have a cleaning afternoon because the, soap, the chalk comes out very readily off of the walls outside. 
So we do drawing, um, we do races, and that's okay because I always lose, that's fine. I've learned that the hard way, don't try to win, I just injure myself. So <laughs> the boys love that because they win me authentically, you know? When they race with their daddy, sometimes they do come back in tears because they don't win, right? So, <laughs> so, I, so I agree that we have to find the balance, you know? Um, what do we do again? We do hopscotch. Um, we do a lot of pretend play. And again, I follow them with that. We have some animal figurines for wild animals and animals in the farm. And I, they will just make up a whole story about these animals going here, there, and everywhere. So sometimes I just chime in with a question like, what is that python doing there? You know, is that python going after the, the other animal? And, you know, and then, I mean, it's really, I really try to follow them. It's less brain work for me. Um, some of the, the other things is um, a lot of puzzles. We like to build puzzles. Sometimes we have a competition who can build the fast, who can build the puzzle the fastest. We did that this afternoon and my six year old won, you know, and I was, I was trying to win. And <laughs> so those are some of the things that we do together with the children. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, I know from our own experiences with Leah, she is a, uh, She's active in terms of she wants to ride, she wants to run, she wants to play balls, you know, play the ball, send the ball, catch the ball. And as you say, you take their lead. So yeah. whatever she wants to do, but she wants to do that whole day. And I know mm -hmm. Lucia said, you know, it doesn't have to be whole day because it's difficult for us to do it. And I know sometimes Tony feels a little guilty when he says, Leah, I can't play right now. I have to work. And so we have to accept that, that we can't play whole day with them, but we play often with her. One of the things yeah. she likes to do is dance. And um, so I, I always tell Tony one day I'll be able to blackmail him because I have him on tape dancing quite a lot with Leah. So um, yeah, it's it's anything that the child likes to do, I think, is, is something that we could really, once it's not harming them, once it's not, um, you know, overexposure to something that might be harmful to them, exposure to anything that might be harmful to them, it's, it's fine, I think. Yeah, yeah. I just want to um, say that uh, what I'm hearing from you, Nicole, is, is, um, is a whole lot of emotion in the play that you have to immerse yourself. You can't just yeah. stand by and watch them. They want you to participate. And I think yeah. a lot of the time as parents, I, I am guilty of it too. You know, you're, you're trying to, you know, me take us up there, say, hold this and go and play. But it, it's not so much the thing the child wants. The child wants you involved. And I, yes. think, I think that is the, uh, one of the messages we're getting across here, that immersion is necessary, that parents have to be involved personally for the play really to have meaning. Yeah, we have yeah. to remember too that the children grow up so quickly and in the twinkling of an eye your child is a, a teenager and then your child is an adult and they're off living their own lives and as Lucia yeah. said memories they have to draw on these memories later on and so that is what we are creating because the time flies so quickly and in the end we need these memories and they thrive on those memories as well that's right and what what i observe too is that when i'm involved in the play with them there is very to little to no sibling rivalry. Everybody's okay, you know, and it, that was a, a real eye opener that my presence there satisfies something within them so deeply that they don't quarrel amongst themselves. Everybody's very gracious and I'm not doing much more sometimes just by being in the space with them. You know, sometimes they are actually doing something but I am physically close. And they can touch me, they can see me right there. And that has such a powerful influence, you know? And then when I involve myself even more and participate, well, they, they get so much emotional satisfaction from that. And, it, you know, it lasts for so long. Yeah. And I realized I don't have to do it all day because I cannot do it all day. But um, I had read somewhere that if I could give 10 to 15 minutes of concentrated attention to them, every hour, right? That that is perfectly fine uh, because I'm a Seattle mom. So I am there with them all day. So that's what I try to do that at least 10 to 15 minutes, I will be give them unfocused attention and involvement in play. And then I will go back, you know, to cook or to clean or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Nicole. Um, 
there is there is actually a therapy that is based on parent child play it's called PCIT parent child interaction therapy and mm -hmm. children with behavioral problems that's how it's dealt with where the therapist actually works on the, with the parent and the child in free play so sometimes the, the therapist may actually be behind a two-way mirror a one-way mirror you know watching on and just guiding the guiding the parent how to play with the child so as Nicole said that she spends 10 to 15 minutes a day, that is definitely sufficient. Also, you don't want to spend all the time with them, not that you don't want to, but remember you have other responsibilities, but children have to learn how to deal with their border. And so if we give them all the solutions later on as they get older, if you build habits that you can't really continue, you can't sustain, a lot of children get themselves in trouble when they get bored, they don't know what to do when they're bored, because they're accustomed with somebody always providing the answers for them. But remember the focus today is play within the family. And so rather than each member of the family just breezing off, just relaxing, just shedding off the stress in their own individual ways, if daily you can spend that spontaneous time just playing with your children, that will bring real benefits to both the children and yourself. Thank you, Lucy. I know you have an next presentation coming, but I just have maybe one more um, comment to make. Um, because of my background and, of course, the time in which I grew up in, things like video games didn't really exist in my in my early uh, early years. So we played a lot of uh, physical a lot of physical activity, or maybe board games and mind games. And I'm wondering now, and maybe you'll touch on this in your next presentation, that children who spend a lot of times just fiddling with these video games all the time or in front of a television, what happens to them in terms of this, all the different games that build hand-eye coordination, that build strength, that build, what, um, what maybe are some of the issues we need to be aware of if children spending these hours and hours just playing these, these games? So we would look a bit at it in the next presentation, but it's also important to know everything in moderation, everything in moderation. So an excess of everything can become problematic. I don't know if that answers your question. So there are well, so it, many benefits to be gained. So we can't just say no. You know, some parents would have just kept their children off devices. We can't just say no, all devices are bad and all internet involvement is negative. No, and we're seeing that more and more now because everybody's livelihood is their device. School, work, socialization, everything takes place now through the use of technology. So it's really about moderating that use is what we have to look at. Okay, thanks, Lucia. Um, Jerome, you want to add anything before we go on to the next presentation? No, I mean, I would just like to add that, you know, while while I, I agree with everything you guys are saying, I think it's always a, a fantastic opportunity when you play with kids, uh, not only to build their confidence through them winning, but you also have an opportunity to teach them when they lose, you know, how to deal with losing, because in life, they will lose, you know, just part of life. And I've seen uh, um, in real life um, experience many cases of people unable to deal with loss. And because that's such a part of life, I think you have an opportunity there as a parent to show them, you know, that it's okay that you lose. Um, the important thing is to know why and, and you can improve on it. And, and that goes with them throughout life um, in different areas, not just in sports, but just holistically, it helps as well. So that's a fantastic opportunity to teach there as well. Thanks very much, Jerome. Um, so, I mean, there's so much more we can talk about and play, but we only have one hour. So maybe Lucia, you can now start your other presentation um, on the <clears throat> addiction. Let me share the screen. So now we want to take a quick look at the dangers of addiction in entertainment. And we've all been hearing about the WHO in recent times. Every presentation on COVID, we hear about WHO. So the World Health Organization defines addiction as the repeated involvement with a substance or activity, despite the substantial harm it can cause because that involvement was or continues to be pleasurable 
or valuable. And so notice we talk about both substances and or activities. So we have chemical addiction, but we also have behavioral addiction. So chemical addiction involves the use of substances like drugs or alcohol, and that's the one most people are familiar with. And we have behavioral addiction. This refers to addiction that involves compulsive behaviors, persistent, repeated behaviors that are carried out even if they do not offer any real benefits. Psychology also defines addiction when a person engages in an activity that is pleasurable, but they cannot stop doing it, even to the detriment of everyday living, things like their work, their hobbies, family time, finances, everything is negatively impacted. But because of the, the rewards that they get from continuing to engage in this activity, they can't stop doing it. And in the long run, there are health and well-being challenges. So you heard me talk about behavioral addiction, compulsive behaviors, and that's the one we want to focus on because we're looking at addiction in relation to entertainment. And although entertainment can sometimes make chemical use or abuse glamorous and lead a lot of persons to experiment with chemicals, which may later on cause addiction, we are more looking at the use of the technology and how persons become addicted to that. So in the DSM, which is a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition has finally included behavioral addictions. However, in this, doc, in this um, compilation of disorders, the criteria needed to be diagnosed with the disorder is clearly listed. And so because research is now starting in the area, there are only two behavioral disorders that are listed in the DSM. That's the gambling addiction and internet gaming disorder. But there are a lot of other behavioral dis um, behaviors. Uh, there are a lot of other behaviors that people are presenting themselves for therapy with. And these include shopping addiction, exercise addiction, food addiction, sex addiction, TV addiction and Facebook and Facebook and social media in general addictions. So these are not things that people say don't do. Nobody's going to say do not shop, do not exercise, don't eat food. So we're seeing that the problem itself is the compulsive behavior, the excessive behavior, and the challenges that it's that caused that are caused by the excessive behavior. So it looks as though anything can become addiction. So we have a lot of persons presenting for professional help and support in these areas. So general signs of potential behavioral addiction include spending large amounts of time engaging in the particular behavior. I'm sure a lot of you can identify with that when you start to binge watch a series, yes? and you don't get a chance to cook, you don't get a chance to do the people work while you're working from home, because as soon as one episode is finished, another one comes up, All right? Now remember, we have no diagnoses for, this, for that, but I just spoke about the TV binging, because research is still going on as to how you will determine what is an addiction and what is not an addiction, how much of the behavior is too much, but I'm just putting it into relatable terms. So spending large amounts of time engaging in the behavior. Urges to engage in behavior, even if it negatively affects daily life, responsibilities, or relationships. So sometimes it's family time, persons having dinner around the table, and there's one person gaming on their phone, chatting with friends. They can't seem to put behind the urge to wait till dinner is finished, but they must respond immediately on the phone. Or they're just scrolling through, and when you ask them what they're doing, they have no idea what they're doing. But they are unable to put aside the urge, they're able to postpone the behavior until it's more appropriate to engage in it. Using the behavior to manage unwanted emotions. So a lot of adults, you come home from work, and you need time. And I know when we spoke about pain, you probably say, no, when I come from work, I just need time to unmask 
time to relax, time to wind down. And so you may put on something on the television or you may have a game that you like to play for relaxation sake. But before you know it, hours go on. You've been on the game, you haven't even spent any time with any members of your family. But because games are built in such a way that they're just challenging enough that you can't get to the next level, but not too challenging that you won't eventually get there with practice. So using the behavior to manage unwanted emotions, that feeling of tiredness. Some people may feel anxious or depressed, so they'll need to watch some television. So there are many different unwanted emotions. And rather than learning some healthy techniques to manage it, they, you use technology or this behavior to manage it. Hiding the behavior or lying to other people about time spent on it. Yeah. So when you see somebody coming in the room, you switch quickly. You're hiding because you know that you're doing something that I don't like to use right and wrong, but something inappropriate. You know that the pleasure that you're getting from this engagement in the activity is not healthy for you or it won't be, it won't be seen as acceptable to other persons. So you hide it or you even tell stories about the amount of time you spent on it. So you have a lot of difficulty avoiding the behavior even when you start to recognize it's problematic or challenging. So you recognize it, yes. You think you wanna stop because you recognize you're not getting all your stuff done, but yet you're having difficulty avoiding it. Then there becomes irritability, restlessness, possible anxiety and depression, or other withdrawal symptoms when attempting to quit. So you tell yourself for the whole day, you're not gonna use your cell phone. But somewhere through the day, you just have that urge. It's not that you're checking your emails or anything in particular. You just have that urge to pick up that device. For the whole day, you're not going to play a particular game. I don't want to call any games tonight, this evening. You're not going to play a certain game. But somewhere or the other, you start to feel very irritable, very restless, probably even anxious. Those are signs of withdrawal symptoms when attempting to quit. And of, we, we said it before, but I want to repeat it because this to me is the crux of addiction. Feeling, to com feeling compelled to continue the behavior even when it causes distress. So addictions and technology. The World Health Organization states that the growing use of internet, computers, smartphones, and other electronic devices is associated not only with the clear and normal benefits so we're acknowledging, as I just said to Tony, we're acknowledging that there are many clear and enormous benefits of technology and some of these other behaviors. But it has also been documented that cases of excessive use, there are many cases of excessive use, which often lead to various addictions with negative health consequences. So it's the two sides of the coin. The same thing that has many benefits if used excessively, can become detrimental, can have many negative health consequences. So this is in regard to gaming. And a study done in 2006 showed that these are some of the short and medium term and the long term effects of gaming. They call it gaming addiction. So of course, the researchers would have studied some persons for a while. And they recognized that persons who were addicted to gaming exhibited feelings of restlessness and or irritability. They were preoccupied with thoughts of the previous time they played the game or the anticipation of the next time they're gonna play the game. They were found to lie to friends or family members about their screen time, about the game that they were playing, the length of time they spent on it and who they were playing it with. They started to isolate themselves from others because their preoccupation with the game. So even when they're not in front of the game, they are thinking about the game. They were fatigued because a lot of you would know persons with gaming, especially if you're gaming with persons networking internationally, they play into wee hours of the morning. Some spend whole night playing games and, of, and they exhibited poor personal hygiene. That was not important to them anymore. So some of the long-term effects can be listed as diet and other health-related issues. Because if you're not eating properly, if you're staying in a seated position for a very long time, Tony spoke about the hand position that you're using all the time. 
right? So you can have a lot of health-related issues as well as mental health issues as depression and anxiety. We had a lack of focus on education or career. So this is not only children, right? Adults as well, they perform poorly at work because they've spent whole night gaming or even at work, they're finding ways, they're strategizing for what is to come. And it has a challenge on family life too. I've seen a couple where the man plays game all day, all day. The wife spends time with him by sitting next to him. But if she only interrupts or asks something to be done or asks him to spend time with her, there is a problem. There's a loss of interest in relationships, that family, friends, et cetera, because now we don't need to play games one-on-one -on -one or with a group of people. We have a whole network of persons available to us. Loss of interest in hobbies and other things that you previously enjoyed. And this is when you're starting to form what looks more like an addiction now. Damage to interpersonal relationships. So not only the loss, but because you keep putting off people or the aggression that you may speak to persons with, you find people pulling away from you. And there may be sleep disorders because you've changed the way that your body clock works. Because if you're going to be up at the night and want to sleep during the day or you're not sleeping at all, you can develop many sleep disorders. But is addiction treatable? I would say yes, addiction is treatable, both chemical and behavioral addictions. Right? So I wanna focus on the behavioral addiction. So as parents, as family members, or even adult individuals, set strict limits on your use of technology. Yes, you may have to use it for work. Yes, you may have to use it for school. You may even use it for socializing with your friends but you determine what is acceptable and appropriate. If it's for your children, sit together in a family meeting and discuss it and set some rules. If it's for you, the adult, you determine because the fact that you're hiding and you're aggressive and you're irritable, you know something isn't right. So you put in front your limits on the use of technology. Control should be implemented for both online and television use. Set time limits. So apart from setting up a schedule, have an idea how long you're going to stay on the game. Remember that challenge, that challenge of wanting to go on to the next step can keep you going on and on and on. The makers of the games know what they're doing. It's the same thing with gambling, online gambling. They know what they're doing. So set time limits on your activities. And for those of you who recognize that you may have a problem, you never saw it that way, but you saw some of the um, behaviors and some of, of how you feel. I just listed it, I just described it. Ask for help. Go to someone and let them know that you think you have a problem. Be open, be truthful and ask for help. Professionally, there's therapy available. Remember I said to you, a lot of persons are presenting for therapy. So, and I listed a lot of things that are normal things for everyday living, normal activities of daily living, but they've become addicted to it and they do it excessively resulting in deleterious effects. So you can go for therapy. You can ask help from self-help groups or peer support groups. And for persons who are, have really serious addictions, medication may be needed, not only to help with the addiction, but because of the other underlying challenges that arise, remember we spoke about health challenges, physical and mental health challenges. So addictions may lead to those physical and mental health challenges for which you need medication. I just wanna share, as Catholics, we believe in the power of prayer. And Pope Francis in April, 2020, had a prayer intention for the liberation from the various addictions that today affect millions of people around the world. We know that our Pope always speaks of mercy and he asks us to be merciful. By supporting persons with addictions, we can alleviate, care for, and even heal the suffering. I didn't say heal the addiction, but heal the suffering associated with new kinds of addiction. Each addiction has different personal history. Each addict, sorry, has a different personal history. And we can embrace people. Remember, they're already isolated. So we can, they must be heard, they must be understood. And regardless, regardless, we are called to love one another. So know that it's not something that you can't pray for. You have faith, we can pray for healing and we must pray for those suffering from addiction so that they can be properly helped and accompanied. 
in 2016, Pope Francis said, dear young people, we did not come into the world to vegetate. We came to leave a mark. And so, although technology is a wonderful and exciting tool that is necessary for us and our children to interact in the world today, it is something we should master and not something that should master us. Do not spend whole day doing one thing because you have goals, you have things, responsibilities, things you have to achieve. And so I like the word, we did not come into the world to vegetate. We came to leave a mark. And so it's important that we find balance in the use of technology. So thank you. I want to throw it out to the panel now so we can behave our, begin our discussion. Thank you very much uh, again, Lucia. <clears throat> again, very informative, very down to it, very simple that we all could understand. Um, I just want to go straight to Jerome because I know you did a lot with um, pornography and, and the new drug. And it is so easily accessible to persons on, on internet and on, on almost any device, any uh, device. tablets, you know. Um, I just want to ask you in your dealing with, with um, pornography and people who maybe who have been into porn, uh, Lucia, you could also answer this too. What normally brings the person to a point when they have to understand that they have a problem? Is it that everything breaks down? Is that they lose something uh, precious to them? What brings them to this point when they realize that it's an addiction? It is an addiction. That they need to treat. Um, thank you guys so much for the question. I think it, it, it boils down to, unfortunately, many times it's when something drastic happens in an individual life. Um, and these things could be very horrendous things like um, we have cases of, um, I know of one particular case where a husband, his wife was, I believe, eight months pregnant and police showed up on her doorstep, arrested her husband for viewing child pornography. She had no idea. And it's not until cases get that drastic that they realize that they need help, unfortunately. And, you know, in many cases that I have seen, um, with people uh, when they go to therapists, and I think Lucia could speak on this too, when you get down to the nitty gritty, the, the real reason why people become addicted to so many different types of substances is there's an emotional need that was not met um, that probably in most cases uh, would have originated in childhood. And this is why, you know, I, mean, I, I advocate what the Pope is saying in terms of wasting time uh, if you want to call it that, with, with your children, spending that time. Sometimes all they need is your presence there. And when many times parents, you know, especially single parents, um, are out there working, uh, they come home, they're just tired, they don't have that time to spend, that quality time that kids need. Um, unfortunately, these games, um, pornography, substance abuse, these things kind of fill that need. And they go on in life because life waits for no one and different things happen. And before you know it, uh, it goes from a compulsive stage to then addiction. And you have a situation where your life is almost so miserable that then they cry out for help. And of course, help is always there and available, but we try to make sure that, you know, prevention is much better than cure. Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, Anybody else wants to chime in on, in terms of um, addictions? Of course, what I have uh, found is that um, many people, they will say that is, I'm not addicted, it's just something I like doing. You, you like running, I like doing this, you know? And it's very difficult to get past that barrier because it, for a human being, it is very difficult to say, I need help, especially men, I need help. And I think that... Um, a lot of the things we see on television, as um, Jerome said earlier, glamorize certain types of activities and people feel that their, that emotional need will be filled by that. And then they get fooled and, they, and then they, they, they get depressed or they, they start doing it more and more, hoping that if I do more of it, then it's gonna fill it. And I know you keep the, the, the donkey after the carrot, never catches the carrot. And I think, um, especially in our families, we, also, we always have to be careful that the behaviors that we see that we need to pounce on them and see what is behind them. Because sometimes as parents, we are afraid to admit, maybe I am not filling a need. And that is why the child is doing that. So you're blaming the child. But mm -hmm. it's, it's you who is, so I think as parents, as, as um, adults, we also need to look within ourselves and see if we are not filling a particular need 
for that yeah. person, and that is why they, they lead to the addiction. Any mm -hmm. other comments? Yeah, the behavioral addictions are really complicated, and that's why the DSM has not listed them as yet, except for internet and gambling, because they're really, really complicated to determine how much of something is too much. As the correct question as you asked, when is it an addiction? Yeah, when does it become addic an addiction? And so those criteria are not clearly understood as yet, and a lot of research is taking place. I'm glad that Jerome pointed out that a lot of times it comes from trauma in childhood. And so parents, we see how important that getting to know our children, that spending time with them, that's really, really important because a lot of the challenges that affect us in teenage and adult years will form during the childhood years. And so I'm not saying because you play with your children, that's not going to happen. But by having open communication with them, you know, you may be quicker able to figure out what's going on with them. Also, remember, we have social learning. So I remember once a form one boy going to swimming lessons, and instead of going into the pool for his swimming lessons, sitting on the bleacher with his cell phone watching pornography. How did he get it? A friend of his first showed it to him. So a friend introduced him to it. And by the time he came to be seen, it was already an addiction. There was already a challenge getting him to put up, put down the phone and not isolate himself from friends, family, even his duties. So I believe we can say it's a disorder or, or an addiction once it starts to affect your daily functioning in life. So you're not doing all your duties, work, school, career, household chores. It starts to take the place of those things. I remember a wife, a pregnant wife, telling me she got up to see her husband, beautiful wife next to him on the bed, on the toilet watching porn. So it affects your daily because clearly it was affecting their sexual relationships now. And we know that's a beautiful gift given for marriage. So it becomes a problem once it's affecting your daily functioning. Okay, so we only have about three more minutes. Uh, ours, the business hour already goes fast, but you have these kind of topics. So any questions? Sure, if I might add, sure. um, if I might add uh, onto what you said, and I think you see your points that are two earlier on, is that, you know, I don't think that you need a clinician or the DSM or a psychologist to tell you that you have a problem. I think naturally, innately as human beings, we know when we are doing something that is wrong. And um, I believe that, you know, the devil is the father of lies. And as Lucia rightly pointed out, you know, we learn socially as well. And there's a social acceptance that these type of things are okay. It's almost okay in society now to have a side check. It's okay to be looking at porn. It's a guy thing. So we accept these things and it sort of builds the belief behind people's use of it. But I think um, when you sit with yourself and you hear the truth, individuals know what they're doing is wrong. Unfortunately, they just get into it so much until they realize, like um, the CEO points it out, your life is now disrupted. The things that you are responsible for, you're no longer able to do it. So if we look within ourselves, we can see when we're going off key and the thing is to kind of um, nip it in the bud before it gets to there, which is why you know, I'm so glad that we are celebrating, you know, marriage and family week here and the importance of play comes in huge here from childhood because you set the tune for the type of individual that this, this boy or this girl is going to be in the next coming year. So spending that time, it's, it's not a want, it's a need that must be met. Thank you, Nicole, 30 seconds. Thank you, Jerome. <laughs> I agree with all that has been said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dakota. I just want to say that, please, um, I think this is where church comes in so importantly. There are so many groups for young people, young adults, married couples in the church that people don't know about, and we need to let them know that they are present and that these groups provide a bulwark. They are support for you in your marriage and in your relationships and in your growing up. And I was fortunate to have that. So I think, you know, we need to let people um, around know that the church has persons, has groups, has organizations that could help you manipulate all these, um, these hurdles. Yes, um, as Jerome said, we have, you know, when you are a single parent home, which I grew up in a single parent home, the parent has the responsibility of providing, um, providing you with what you require, what you need. But somehow the parent also has to, and that's where community comes in, church comes in. The church and the community has to fulfill that, that 
um, need that gap that the parent cannot provide all the time. And it's not their fault because sometimes the single parents happen. The situation happens not because of something you did, but because of something that happened. And so we have to be there for them and we have to support them and help them as well. Okay, thank you very much. So well, you have to go now, unfortunately. So Lucia, thanks very much for your wonderful presentations. Jerome, thanks for your insight. Nicole, our good mother, keep going. Hold the fourth or the fifth. And God bless, <laughs> God bless all of you. And we love you. And we'll see you. Keep celebrating Family Week. Remember, we have mass tomorrow. Tomorrow is the grandparents, grandparents day, elderly people day. Elderly people day. And of course, Monday, Joe Kim and Anne celebrating married couples. Okay, so God bless. Take care. Okay, bye, guys. Bye-bye. Take bye, care. Bye, everyone. Bye.